Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Nivash. I'm the Senior Brand Manager for Gusmer Enterprises, and I'd like to welcome you today to Gusmer's Wine Webinar Series with our strategic partner, Christian Hansen. We are pleased that you're joining us for the use of non-saccharomyces yeast in winemaking webinar. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our presenter, Duncan Ham, joining us from Italy. Also from Christian Hansen, a special thank you to Duncan and his time and for his great presentation to that. And with that, I'm gonna roll it over to Duncan to kick off the presentation. Thank you, Duncan. Thanks so much, Chris. And good morning, everybody. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as Chris said, my name's Duncan Ham. I work for Christian Hansen and I work as an application scientist. I've, I've worked for the company for 14 years. Um, and my background is uh, originally in chemistry, but I also have a graduate diploma in viticulture and enology from Lincoln University in New Zealand. So let's go into the agenda for today. So it's a topic I very much like talking about. And we've broken the talk down into, into four different sections. First of all, we just wanted to introduce the concept of non saccharomyces by just saying, look, what's the What's the yeast landscape behind, beyond just your average standard Saccharomyces yeast? Then we can move into how non-Saccharomyces yeast have a or, positive organoleptic impact. The third section is actually about biological protection, and this is very much an up and coming topic within the use of, within the sphere of non-Saccharomyces. And then lastly, with just a few slides on how and, and when to apply non-saccharomyces. In terms of questions, um, Chris and I think that it's probably best if we keep the questions at the end of each section. So maybe I'll ask once a complete section in case there's any questions and then we can answer them and then move on to the next one. So I trust that would work. I think I saw a question then. Nope. No, it's just okay. me hitting the raise the hand button if there's <laughs> any other question. Okay. So I'm going to actually start off with um, this table here because I'm going to refer to it a few times in the talk. And this is um, our company's yeast range. Um, all seven of these yeasts are available in North America through, through Guzma. And at the top, we have four strains of non-saccharomyces. We've got Fruits and Prelude, Concerto and Octave, and I'm going to talk in a lot more detail about those. Um, the next section down is our Saccharomyces yeast, and really not going to talk much about Saccharomyces today, um, other than to say that they're both really good products. Um, the great thing about Merit is it's a fructophilic yeast. It's very, very robust. Um, it will ferment up to, we say 17% alcohol, but we, we've actually seen it work in things like Amarone at well over 18%. Um, but the fact that it's fructophilic, but it gives a really nice profile. It actually is a really nice alternative to the, your, your more traditional fructophilic yeast, which perform well, but don't necessarily give the best flavor. Um, and then we've also got a product called Jazz. Jazz is actually a direct inoculation saccharomyces. So there's no rehydration. You literally add it as a dry powder, which makes it very easy to use. It's a lovely product in um, Syrah, Merlot, more fruit driven Cabernet um, and also Rosé. And lastly at the bottom we also have a product called Melody. Melody is a, a blend of Saccharomyces and non-Saccharomyces. We won't talk much about that today. Um, the, the best thing I can say about this product is it's a really good entry um, into non-Saccharomyces because it's, it's everything's in one packet and the winemaker literally needs to add yeast only once. So I'm just going to progress to the first question. What is the yeast landscape beyond Saccharomyces? And if we look at the ecology of wine, it's actually very complex. It's, there's a quite a broader range of microorganisms. And if we just look at, at yeast, um, we find all sorts of, we can find all sorts of things. Um, obviously, we've got some things we really don't want, like Britannomyces, also known as Decra, um, Candida, Cryptococcus, um, Debromyces, Hansenospora, also known as Clockera, Hansenula, we have Lachantia, 
which is a species that uh, has been commercialized. And in fact, our company has two Lachancia thermotolerance. We have Tarula spora. We also have one of those. Um, and then we see things like Saccharomycodes. Um, I haven't seen one of these being commercialized in the wine industry, but there is actually a strain sold um, from a German research institute of, of, of Saccharomycodes for non-alcoholic beer. We also have schizosaccharomyces, schizosaccharomyces, zygosaccharomyces, also known as zygo for short. Uh, Mechnicobia, we see some commercial Mechnicobia strains. Pickier, we have a Pickier cluveri. We also have rotid, rototorula. Now, that's a, quite a broad range of, of species. However, it's always Saccharomyces, um, or Saccharomyces cerevisiae to be more specific, that completes primary fermentation. So just a little bit more about this diverse ecology. Um, and to help, I guess, demonstrate this point, we've actually used a reference. It's from a paper that's 14 years old now. It's from a researcher called Matt Goddard. Um, but despite its age, it's still a fundamental principle in winemaking. And this paper actually looked at some uninoculated or wild ferment Chardonnay barrels at a winery called Kumi River, which is quite a famous winery in New Zealand, make, make some excellent Chardonnay. And they actually tracked the populations of well, all the non-Saccharomyces strains present and also the Saccharomyces over time. So on the x-axis on the left, we have the millions of um, self-forming units for the yeast. And on the right, we have the ethanol percentage and temperature in degrees C. So this red line is the temperature profile during ferment across the average of the four barrels. And the blue line is the ethanol concentration. But what's really interesting is these populations. What's really, really great, apart from one barrel, which has a slight sort of spike on day eight, across the four barrels, there's almost no Saccharomyces present. It's literally just the non-Saccharomyces yeast present that are dominating and controlling and driving the fermentation. And then we see something very, very interesting. As this ethanol starts to climb and starts to hit you know, around five, six percent, you suddenly see the Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces come from nowhere and just totally dominate. So that represents the natural progression, I guess, in winemaking. Um, I'm just going to jump to the next slide because this is an this is a way of, I guess, presenting the model in a simplified way, where we'd start off with the non-Saccharomyces peak, followed by Saccharomyces, and then obviously we have ML, ML further down the line, represented here by Enococcus or Lactobacilli. Um, but this early peak of non-Saccharomyces is really where we're interested. And, and I guess the question is, can that be manipulated to have a positive impact on the sensory of the wine? or some other impact beyond um, just sensory, perhaps a, a level of protection. So that was the end of my first section. Are there any initial questions? I don't see any at this time. As a reminder, you can hit the raised hand and I can unmute you when um, you have a question. I think we can move on, Duncan. Great. I'm just going to find a pointer. There we are. So. The next section, how non-saccharomyces can have a positive organoleptic impact. So to help demonstrate this, um, we've got this, this table presented here. Uh, one of my colleagues produced this uh, a few years ago, and it's actually based on a literature search with, non, with different papers with non-saccharomyces, and it really looks at the keywords. And he came up with, with eight different keywords, esters, alcohols, terpenes, lactones, glycerol, manoproteins, thiols, and organic acids. And then we've got each color represents a different genera of, of non-saccharomyces. What's really, really interesting is we can further break it down a bit. And first of all, we would say that some of these areas are very much about flavor, flavor and aroma. Um, and that's through either converting precursors present in the juice or must, or through the yeast actually synthesizing these themselves. Secondly, in our terms of, to flavor, we can look at acid balance. 
non-saccharomyces can have an effect on acid. Now that could be through the production of organic acids from sugar. Um, it could be through um, some malolactic conversion that some yeast can do. That's that's kind of out of outside of today's talk. Um, or it could be just the fact that non-saccharomyces yeast are better adapted to freshly crushed grape juice um, and tend to produce, if you start a fermentation with a non-saccharomyces, you actually tend to get a lower acetic acid level, lower VA, because the VA production from saccharomyces is a stress response to osmotic pressure. And lastly, the other area is mouthfeel, textural elements, and it could be polysaccharides, amount of proteins, even glycerol. Glycerol is a little bit of a controversial one as to how effective that is on mouthfeel, but nevertheless, glycerol has been extensively studied with respect to non-saccharomyces. So there's these three areas that we would say there's a positive organoleptic effect from non-saccharomyces. So I'm just going to refer back to our table that we introduced at the beginning. And I'm actually going to talk about these two products at the top, Fruitsin and Prelude. Fruitsin is a strain of Picchia cluvari. It's a frozen direct inoculation yeast. Um, it comes in a very unique format, and we'll be able to see that on the next slide. Prelude, in, in contrast, was the first um, pure strain of non-saccharomyces that we, we commercialized and it's a strain of Teruelospora del Brookii. So a little bit about fruits. And now you can see on the right-hand side, there's pictures of using it. It comes in this nice little box here. It's a one kilogram pack, and it's got a frozen liquid yeast inside. Now it can either be thawed, it takes around 30 minutes in a water bath at around 77 degrees Fahrenheit, or it can actually be inoculated frozen as well. And this is what we have at the top here. By cutting the packaging, it's able to be dropped into the top of some juice here. And we can see it floating. So it's very, very easy to inoculate. There's no rehydration or anything needed with this product. Um, now, it's a, it's a picky glue, right? It was isolated and, and studied extensively in New Zealand for its ability to produce volatile thiols, particularly 3MH and 3MHA, or in, in some spheres, they're also referred to as 3SH and 3SHA. And just to give an example here, this is um, a winemaking trial. And we've got the 3MH on the left-hand side and the 3MHA on the right-hand side. And we've got the yellow bar represents the, two, the concentrations of these two thiols in the control wine, which was just fermented with QA23, which is a pretty popular Sauvignon Blanc yeast in Marlborough where this was conducted. Then we have in the orange line, we have a, what, we, what we've called a co-inoculated. By co-inoculating, we're not talking about adding bacteria and yeast, we're just referring to the fact that the fruits in, and the QA23 were both added at the same time. And then on the green line, we have a 48 hour delay between the two inoculations. So the, the fruits and went in first, and then 48 hours later, um, the QA23 was added. Now, if we think back to our population progression, it's exactly what we're trying to do by staging the inoculations in this way. And it's more effective, as we can see, there's almost double the amount of uh, volatile thiols compared to the control wine um, by doing this. Another interesting area within Fruitsin is ethyl esters. And we've got three ethyl esters represented on this table here, ethyl octanoate, ethyl decanoate, and ethyl dodecanoate. This is actually the same wine, which is in the previous table. Um, and we see a significant increase in these three um, ethyl esters, which um, contribute to fruit, fruit character. We've got the Descriptions here on the right hand side pineapple here, apricot, sweet, brandy, floral for ethyl dodecanoate. One thing that's also really interesting with, with fruits, and as a company, we tend to position it and aim it towards uh, white wines. And I know in, the, in, the, in North America, it's, it's very popular with um, warmer climate warmer climate Sauvignon Blanc to make, make it just a little bit closer to that cooler climate more punchy style. 
It's also popular for fairly neutral varieties like French Colombard, where it can really give a, a strong fruit um, identity. But um, one other potential usage for it is in red wines. Now this compound here, ethyl, deca do, uh, ethyl decanoic, as well as ethyl octanoic to some degree, um, have both been associated with, um, well, increased higher levels of these two compounds are both correlated to higher quality tiers of Pinot Noir. And that's from some research in New Zealand. And it's really interesting. And one thing, reason why I'm saying this is there's a very, very interesting YouTube clip on the Guzma page within YouTube. Um, and it's an endorsement from Dom Sebastiani and Sons talking about using fruits in, in red wines. And I'm sure that some of this effect they see on fruit weight in reds is down to these two ethyl esters being um, produced in, in much more significant concentrations. I'm going to move on to Prelude now. As I mentioned, Prelude is a Turulus Forum. Um, we first commercialized it in 2009, and it's it's a really, really interesting yeast. It's got some um, some really strong characters, but where it has its bigger, biggest effect tends to be on palate weight or mouthfeel. And to help demonstrate that, we've got this, this spider chart. From a Cabernet Sauvignon trial, we ran in a small region called the Ribera del Juca, which is it's a subregion of La Mancha in Spain. And in the trial, we, we had one treatment with Prelude, another with our Concerto yeast. But what was really interesting is we see a lot more body with it from the treatment with the Prelude. And actually, we see a really nice masking of green character as well from the Prelude. And that's something we've studied. We know that um, there's particularly shorter chain, chain ethyl esters that um, Prelude tends to produce, which are quite effective in masking things like uh, methoxypyrazine in, in red wine. And we really see it in here. We see less of a green beanie character in this particular wine. I just also make a reference to this paper at the bottom here. Again, it's not the most recent paper, but it's the fundamentals are, are the same. And it's, it's um, from Comatini, uh, who's an Italian researcher. But it's a very, very good paper looking at um, different non saccharomyces species. And among all the metabolites they measure, they do measure polysaccharides. And they clearly see that Torulospora produces much, much higher levels of polysaccharides. So in terms of building pallet weight, it's a really, really interesting tool. Actually, an, another comment on the polysaccharides, it's also correlated to moose stability in sparking wines. So it potentially has a, a good um, application there. We talked earlier about um, osmotic stress and VA production. And one particular area where we see prelude as being particularly effective is, is with really high sugar musts, where there's a propensity towards high levels of acetic acid. And to help demonstrate it, we've got this example here. It's, it's from ISVV, which is part of the University of Bordeaux. And it's in a botrytized semion. So I think I'm pretty sure the starting sugar was around 300 grams per liter, so yeah, 30 bricks, pretty 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 sugary environment. Um, and as you can see by studying the fermentation with the Torula spora on the right hand side, we actually have around half the level of acetic acid produced. So this could be useful for sweet wines. It could also be quite effective in um, particularly warm climate reds as well, where there's a lot of ripeness and, and sugar levels climb pretty high. So that brings us back to our yeast table. And the next two yeasts I'd like to talk about are both of the same species. They're both Lachancia thermotolerans. And we have, we have two yeasts of the species with quite different positioning. And I'll, I'll talk um, about that in more detail, but they're both, they're, they're called Concerto and they're called Prelude. And we tend to position them like this, that Octave is, ideal for whites and rosé, and I'll explain why, because there's actually a very good fundamental reason for this. Whereas Concerto is actually far better in red wines. But if we go back to our Cabernet from the Ribera del Juca, 
um, again, we can see from the concerto, we have a bit more acidity in the wine compared to the prelude. Um, and we know that the chance of thermotolerance has the ability to produce lactic acid from grape sugars. So this comes through in this wine. But we also see overall just general fruitiness um, and stronger blackberry and strawberry characters. And that's really interesting because it's due to this, in, in part to this reaction here, um, this yeast, this species is able to produce chromical lac ethyl lactate uh, by taking lactic acid and combining it with ethanol to produce this ester here. Just to demonstrate sort of concentrations that you can expect, um, I've got two, we've, we've, this is some data from with um, experimental strains of, of Lachancia thermotolerance, um, where we had a saccharitis control, and then we had two trial treatments where we started with Lachancia, followed three days later by, um, by the, the same Saccharomyces. And actually we, we, we get around 15 times greater ethyl lactate concentration with this particular strain of Lachancia here. So it's a really, really important compound. And it's one of the, um, one of the strong points about using Lachancia, you get this really bright lifted fruit character. This is just a little bit more detail. I mentioned that Lachance is able to produce um, lactic acid from grape sugars. This is some data from the south of France um, from around two years ago. It's in a rosé that was actually preserved a free rosé. And it's a 20 to three day ferment when we use both Concerto and Octave. Again, we use the three day rule. So once the, the juice had been clarified, it was inoculated with the, the chance of thermotolerance either the concerto or prelude. And then after 72 hours, it was then inoculated with the Saccharomyces. And in this example, we actually finished with around 3.7 grams per liter of lactic acid. So that's very, very significant. What's really interesting as well is compared to the control, um, the control pH is what, 3.52. Um, compare it to the octave, it's 3.35, much, much lower. And so not only is there more, more structure, more freshness to the wine, but any sulfur you add is far, any, it, it, well, sulfur is far more effective because you've got 2.8% of your free would be um, molecular versus only 1.9 at the pH that the controls at. So it's a re really good tool um, and it has multiple benefits, not just flavor wise, but also with stability. Um, one other area is um, tartaric acid usage. Now, I, I've just spent five and a half years living in Australia, and in Australia, um, tartaric acid standardization is incredibly popular and very standard practice. We see that a yeast like Octave has potentially been a very good alternative to this because if you're able to produce um, acidity naturally through a yeast, it's far more sustainable and better for wine quality than any bags of tartaric acid. Now, from our calculations, we've, we've worked out that if, if the octave can produce 180 grams per hectolitre, so that's uh, 1.8 grams per litre of, of lactic acid, that's equivalent to adding 1.5 grams per litre of tartaric acid. Likewise, if it's 300 grams per hectolitre, um, that's equivalent to two and a half grams per hectolitre of tartaric acid. So there's potentially big savings there. Um, not only that, lactic acid is very stable, um, whereas tartaric acid is useful, um, but a lot of the tartaric acid that might be used at the start of the wine making process to standardise the pH is going to end up precipitating out anyway. So with lactic, it's very, very stable. Um, it tends to give good persistence and um, it's, it's a, a generally positive thing if, if you can have uh, lactic acid rather than tartaric. This is just some further comparisons. This is from Australia. This is um, some trials that I was involved in last year where we took some Syrah or Shiraz if you're in Australia um, and we bled it off to get some 
juice to make some rosé. And we used our jazz Saccharomyces as a control. And we also had a treatment with Concerto and with Octave. And both of these were also inoculated with jazz um, two days after the non-Saccharomyces was added. But in the final wine, we we're able to get around 3.5 grams per liter of lactic acid from the Octave. So significantly more than we could get from the Concerto. The blue graph here represents the final titratable acidity. As you can see, it's much, much higher, um, over 10 grams per liter in terms of um, if you represent it as tartaric. pH is lower, significantly lower, 3.5 versus 3.7. And the other really nice thing is the ethanol level. The final ethanol is half a percent lower. So not only is the wine fresher, juicier, more balanced, but when we've put it through a um, sentry panel, it's also been um, noted as being less cloying and less hot, just because it's got a little bit less alcohol at, combined with the extra acidity. This is just to summarize the two Lachancias. Um, I think this is a really nice slide. If it's rosé or white wine, we tend to strongly um, advocate using Octave, just simply for that acidity. If it's a red wine, we would generally strongly recommend using Concerto. If you are going to use Octave, just beware that because it's a lactic acid, oh, quite, a, quite a significant lactic acid producer, it can actually block MLF. And I'm going to talk about that in the next section because potentially that's a that could be a good thing for some some styles of wine. Um, whereas Concerto will produce one 1.5 grams of lactic acid um, at the most in a red wine making environment, uh, which is not going to be enough to cause problems with ML. For sparkling wine, if it was a traditional method, which would probably go through Malo, then we'd recommend Concerto for things like Charmat or for just carbonation, then Octave's perfect. And lastly, we can see both of them having a good application for fortified or late harvest wines. Um, it could be for the reduction of VA, um, or it could just be for the, the flavor that they bring. So that was the end of my second section. I think we have a question here. Ah. So there's a question. It didn't denote if it's L or D lactate. It's L lactate. We, um, no problem. Yeah, no, it's, it's important because, ah, look, D lactate's generally not measured, but I, in some country, I know Italy, for example, for example, D lactate's often used as a measure of spoilage. So if we had a yeast producing D lactate, um, it's, that that could be a little bit problematic. Any other questions? We can, you can either raise your hand or ask it in the Q&A. Okay, Duncan, I think we're ready to move on. Cool, okay. So the next part is very much in, a, in I guess, an emerge, I wouldn't want to say an emerging technology. It's arrived, but we haven't, we're, we're by no means at the um, summit of this particular peak, and that's using non Saccharomyces as a tool against spoilage. So, effectively, for biological protection. So, to help, so, um, to help demonstrate it, I've got this, um, I've, I've lifted this definition from a paper from Antonio Morata. Um, who I think is from the Polytechnica de Madrid. And uh, how, he, he, his, his description is really interesting. He said that um, bioprotection is a current concept. So its definition is still under discussion. I think that's a fair point. However, it can be considered the active or passive use of some microorganisms to preserve food and beverages and to exclude other spoilage micro, microorganisms thus avoiding the production of off flavors, sensory alterations, or even the formation of toxic molecules. So it's quite a mouthful, but I think it's a pretty good definition of where things are at in this particular area. Now, this paper that I've referenced here, this is a literature review. 
he's just talking about non saccharomyces yeast. There is also um, a case to be made for bioprotection from bacteria. And in fact, we've, we've launched a specific bioprotective bacteria in the last 12 months. However, it's beyond the scope of today's presentation. So we'll just talk about yeast. And most BioP work in the wine area is with yeast. So just to go further on the active versus passive, I've lifted this table from another literature review. This, try, this time it's De Giovanito and others, um, which this was written by um, the group that work out of the University of Turin under Professor Luca Coquelin. And I've included it because it really tries to show some, some mechanisms or summarize the mechanisms between active and, and passive um, bioprotection. So in terms of passive strategies, what we're talking about is a yeast or bacteria which you would inoculate competing against spoilage organisms for things like carbohydrates, nitrogen, could be sterols, vitamins and macronutrients, or potentially for oxygen, or even for space. But we're not talking about any killer effect or anything like that. We're just literally talking about one organism outgrowing um, spoilage organisms. In contrast, active competition strategies are much more about different, um, I guess, compounds or activities from microorganisms, which actively inhibit um, spoilage organisms. So it could be the production of antimicrobial compounds like killer toxin or lactic acid, or it could be through cell-to-cell -cell contact. And I've included a reference here from, um, it was a paper published this year. Um, co it was authored by the University of Copenhagen, but some of the people in the team I work in also were, were co-authors. And they did some really interesting work looking at um, picicluvri in the presence of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, but also with having um, supernatant from from the different yeast, putting them together and um, having membranes and actually trying to ascertain what effect the cell to cell contact have. I won't go into any more detail on that, but if, if anyone was ever interested in learning more about cell to cell contact, I think it's the best paper I've seen in the sphere of analogy talking about the area. Uh, it also explains why sometimes I think we see our, our particular rate gives the best possible results before the Saccharomyces is, is inoculated. And we saw that with the volatile thiols from New Zealand, and we'll see that in another example as well. So this is a good example of uh, passive bioprotection. This is um, actually a cold soak trial that we did with our prelude. Um, and we had two different temperature regimes. I'll just explain it to, because it's not immediately obvious. We had um, a temperate re a regime where we kept the must at 30 degrees C. And we also had another one where we actually incubated, first of all, at 12 degrees C, and then cooled after four days to five degrees C. And what is really interesting and what I really wanted to highlight here is this orange line, which represents this, the, the prelude cell count. So at 12 degrees C, we see significant growth of the prelude. In fact, we see just as significant growth of the prelude. Uh, in fact, we see better growth at 12 than we do at 30 degrees. Um, but then once the must is cooled to five degrees, we see continued growth and then proliferation. So it really does demonstrate that this yeast is really good in, in cold conditions. Um, and the upshot of this is we tend to recommend this yeast for protection during cold soak. Uh, now, during in this time, it's simply the fact that it's well adapted to cold temperatures and better adapted than you, your typical spoilage organisms would be, that it's a, it's a good candidate because it can take over and it can dominate and it's not likely to produce any negative compounds, unlike a spoilage organism. This is the second example, and this is um, our Pickier Cluvari and oxygen consumption. Now, our strain of Pickier, which is called Fruitsin, the, well, the one that we, we market to the wine industry is called Fruitsin. 
is, um, is very, very good at scavenging oxygen. And we've got some interesting data here from Sancerre from 2012. So it's a few years old, but nevertheless, it's still, still really valuable um, where we have a control wine without any bioprotective yeast. And then we've tried prelude fruits and as well as the fruits and treatment without any SO2. And we can see that the, the treatments with fruits and tend to drop um, to the lowest levels of dissolved oxygen the fastest. On the right hand side, we have some, some data from the University of Auckland. And here they've measured the uh, dissolved oxygen. And that's the green line here with the picky by itself. And actually the picky by itself is able to consume the oxygen and scavenge it much quicker than either the Saccharomyces or the Saccharomyces and Picchia blended, co-inoculated together. So that really does show that when it's by itself, the Picchia works best. However, on this particular page, the, the, I think the most important picture is this one in the, bot, in the bottom right here. This is a trial where we had our fruits and yeast against a, uh, it's an, it was another bioprotective yeast. It was a different species. And it's really clear just by looking at it, there's far, far less oxidative browning in the fruit and fruits and treatment compared to the, the control with, with the different um, with the different bioprotective yeast. Just to continue on the same theme with oxygen, it's an important mechanism um, for controlling things like Hansenospora uvarum. And this trial here is looking at the the Hansenospora population in two different tanks, one that's been inoculated with fruits and one that hasn't. The dark blue line is the fruits and tank. And what we see is we actually see quite a good fungostatic effect over the first three days when it comes to the uvarum. And then we see a drop altogether. If we contrast that with the control, we actually see outgrowth in the first day and around two logs higher levels of, of the uh, Hansenospora. Um, right throughout and then it proliferating right throughout the fermentation. The plates on the right hand side here demonstrate uh, this is the wine when it was plated at, at day four. So at this point here and in the control in the trial with the fruits and we aren't able to get any ants in a spore to grow on the plates. If we compare that to the control, there's significant levels. So I like to show this because it's a very visual way of, of showing that it really does control the the level of Hansen spora really significantly. This um, last point I had on bioprotection is to do with Lachancia thermotolerance. Um, we know that this particular species has this pathway which is able to convert grape sugars to lactic acid. And it's something that could also be utilized in a bioprotective, um, in a bioprotective way. To help demonstrate it, we have this graph here where we have malic acid and time on the bottom. And we have a wine with different levels of lactic acid. So with no lactic acid, we see malo progress really quickly at 1.5. There's a short lag, but it does go through. If we go to three grams per litre, there's a much bigger lag, but eventually it starts to move. And at four and a half grams, we see it blocked altogether. We believe that's a quite an interesting tool, particularly in things like preserved and free wine making. Um, for styles, we really want to prevent ML from happening, but there's a big risk that it could happen. So it's potentially a really good tool. Um, on the right hand side here, we've just got the malic and the lactic concentrations. In a trial where with this was a rosé from the south of France, the control wine went through a spontaneous malo. The two with octave um, did not. It was able to be prevented. Plus, we can see we've got high levels of lactic acid from, from the yeast, which is, is the reason why. Duncan, we do have a question yep. from Mark. Okay. If yep. you want to go in the Q&A, you can read the full. What is the optimal yep. time to add Saccharomyces yeast and um, adding nutrients when using Prelude? Okay. Well, I've, I have that coming up in the next section. Actually, 
if it can we wait till then and maybe we can revisit that is that okay I think so. And then I'll get back yep. to Mark and see if we answer yep. those questions. Exactly. That sounds perfect. Excellent. So we have, um, this is just a metagenomics graph. Now, this is really interesting. Metagenomics is actually becoming more and more accessible in the wine industry. It, it started off being pretty expensive, but it, the prices have come down. Um, and we've been involved with some quite big metagenomic projects. I'll just explain explain this quickly. Um, these colorful graphs represent relative proportions of different microbial DNA left in a sample. So it's not measuring live cells. It's, it's measuring what you could probably call the microbial history. Now, these two on the left-hand side is a control ferment with just Saccharomyces. And these teal colored bands represent the Saccharomyces and, and sure enough Saccharomyces is inoculated. It becomes the dominant species in the history of the sample right at during halfway through fermentation and at the end. We do however see not a huge but there's there's these two bands and for this a band at the heart at the halfway stage and at the end of fermentation which is um, related to Hansinospora. If we compare that to the trial that it was up against was where we had a chance of thermotolerance and Saccharomyces. It was our concerto strain. This was a red wine ferment. Um, first of all, we have this kind of yellowy green band, which is the chancea, and it's nice. It actually implants really well. And at the end of fermentation, there's more lachancea DNA left in the sample than there is Saccharomyces. So it's it's really good at implantation. But the other nice thing is we see a lots a lots lower, smaller band of Hansen spora. So that just helps to show that that's had a really positive effect in this example. I guess one, one comment talking to my colleague, Davis Vector, who looks after our sales in, in North America, he, he asked me to just make the comment that this sort of analysis is getting more and more accessible. And it is something that we'd be willing to have a discussion um, with, with, with wineries alongside with, with Guzma as well, to see if it's something that um, we could we could do together and, and build some knowledge and some information. So this is my last section, how and when to apply non sacrament ICC. So Mark, I really hope I answer your question, but we can we can revisit it in case I don't. So we strongly recommend sequential timing. And that's purely because we're trying to manipulate the, the chart we looked at at the beginning where you'll have a non-Saccharomyces peak followed by a Saccharomyces peak. If the Saccharomyces goes in early, it's gonna take over because it's not like Matt Goddard's four vet barrels of Chardonnay at the beginning where his Saccharomyces was coming from a very low base. When you inoculate a commercial Saccharomyces, you're going in somewhere around one to five million cells per mil. So much, much higher. So we do recommend staggering the two inoculations. We do have some customers who don't add Saccharomyces. It is riskier, but it can work in some circumstances. Again, it does depend on, on the style of wine, the, the, the ethos of the winemaker, um, how closely you're watching the wine, that sort of thing. But generally, we would recommend a 48-hour window between adding a, a, a non-sac, which would normally be done at the, the normal point of yeasting, and then 48 hours later, add the uh, sac, your typical Saccharomyces. With our strains, we would generally say if, if you were going to introduce a non-sac, um, stick with the same Saccharomyces you would normally use. We see pretty good compatibility between the non-sacs and the Saccharomyces. So we have the 48 hour window, but a really interesting point is what if you're cold soaking? And that's really interesting. If you are having cold soak, you can actually inoculate your non-sac right at the start of the process. So you can get that protection right throughout the, the cold soak, let your must warm up. And once it's warm, you know, within a day or so, you can then add your Saccharomyces. So that's the timing of how we would recommend using a non-sac. 
A really important point though, is the rehydration. It's really important to note that it's not the same as your typical Saccharomyces inoculation. First of all, we would have a, re a requirement of having the SO2 below 30 parts per million. Um, we would also recommend paying attention. If, if, if you've got chlorinated water, we would say do not use it. Try and have water, water that's been filtered to remove the chlorine um, because chlorine is, it's not good for any yeast, even Saccharomyces. Um, but with non-sacs, they're arguably more sensitive. So we'd say watch, watch for chlorine with the rehydration. Um, the overall process is similar to a Saccharomyces. You'll have a rehydration step followed by an activation before you then inoculate. I've mentioned the total SO2. We would say 30 ppm is the most for our dry uh, non-sacs, and um, that's total, not free. So me measure the, the total. Um, and the reason we say total is that actually bound sulfur can still come across the cell wall, um, even, even if it's bound to you know, polyphenol or something else within the mast. And then lastly, the temperature. This is one of the most important things. I know winemakers that are incredibly smart. One of them I know well, he has a PhD and um, even he's, he, he's sort of contact, he contacted me once and said, hey, look, I'm not very happy with this non-sac. It hasn't worked as I normally expect it would. And we did a bit of troubleshooting and it turned out he rehydrated at 37 degrees C, which is far too hot. It, we would say 30 degrees is the absolute maximum. So that's, I think, um, we would tend to say aim for 77 Fahrenheit um, as the best temperature. So as long as you respect that and keep it within sort of 68 to 77, you'll be absolutely fine. Now, Mark, you asked about nitrogen. As general practice, we would recommend measuring yans. I know not, not all winemakers do it. In fact, when I worked in a winery, we, we didn't do it. We just used to add nutrients because we kind of assumed we, and it kind of worked, but actually measuring, I think measuring yan is a quite a powerful thing to do. Um, I'd strongly recommend it. Um, if you do need to add nutrients, uh, the recommendation I make, so this is, this is Duncan Hans' recommendation rather than necessarily Christian Hansen's or, or Garzmer's, I would actually tend to add the nutrients just when you add the Saccharomyces. Most must is going to have enough nitrogen in it already for the non-saccharomyces population. And then once you have your saccharomyces in there, feed that one. That the saccharomyces, it's this population that really has to go the distance. So it's a really important one to, to feed with nutrients. Um, and just for a last, last point, I'd say as a good rule of thumb, 250 parts is about the, the right level. Um, to aim for. So a little bit higher than if you weren't using a non-saccharomyces. But potentially because you've got two populations, it is important that they're both fed and, and both effective. Now, we know that different, different non-saccharomyces species have different nitrogen requirements. So this is a sort of a general rule. Um, but if you follow it, you won't go too far wrong. So that was my last slide. Um, should we have some more questions? We do have some more, but I'm going to open the mic for um, Mark okay. Anderson real quick. Okay. Mark, I just, oops, um, I just wanted to see if we answered your questions. I don't know if he's, if yes, he's thank you. There. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Let me meet you back. Um, and then Duncan, we did have two more from Brian and Sean in the questions, the Q&A section. Yep. Oh, just before we go there, I just see that Mark also asked uh, that, um, that the prelude and the cab stab brought forward. Um, yeah, I would, that's typically not what we would see. And we do, if it gets up to 25 Celsius, so what's that, at 77, it, it can tick along, but not nearly as fast as if Saccharomyces would. 
but but I'd also probably say most times prelude is used. It's in red. It's more for a soak. So once the, it starts to get up to about 68, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, most winemakers would then add the Saccharomyces. So I, I guess a comment with around like any yeast, if you can keep it a little bit cooler, it will slow it down. Um, but it generally, one of the beauties about using prelude is um, it won't race. Unlike if you were to cold soak with a, with the Saccharomyces, just waiting for a little bit of heat to race through some sugar. Sorry. Yep. Sorry, um, Chris. We, what was the next Sorry. question? Um, no worries. Are you able to see them in the Q&A section? For Brian, what would the issue with inoculation with non sec during settling before racking or white juice? What ah, right. Yes. Great question. Oh, I love this question. <sighs> Yeah, we didn't really know the answer to this. And actually we've seen pretty good results by even adding non-saccharomyces in the vineyard. We don't necessarily advocate spraying it on a vine because then you're getting into viticultural territory and, and there's a whole set of regulations around that. But obviously once, once that fruit is off a vine, it becomes an ology. Um, so we've seen people actually inoculate fruits in, um, even concerto, prelude, all in the vineyard once it's picked, uh, particularly with machine harvested fruit, because you've got you know that nice sort of liquid that's going to help get the yeast going. Um, now, to answer the question with um, with with settling, no problem at all, no problem with settling. The only clarification technology we would say to avoid is flotation with chitazan. So not even flotation. Flotation is fine if it's with gelatin or something, but um, if if it's if chitosan is involved, then it's a little bit of a red flag for us. Now, not all chitosan is bad either, but we do know that chitosan is a, is a, is a yeast killer, and so it can be a problem. So generally, if it's cold settling, no problem. In fact, it's it's great to to add you're getting the, your non-saccharomyces in there nice and early, so it's going to have an even better effect. Does that answer the question? Brian, if that doesn't answer the question, let me know and we can either unmute you. Hold on. Oh, it did. Perfect, Duncan. Cool. And then the Excellent. last question, when using the non-sac yep. yeast, will the nutrients yep. be depleted and the demand be higher when you inoculate with Saccharomyces yeast? Yes. Now, what's really interesting, so I mentioned earlier, we, we, have, we know that different species will, they have slightly different demands and we've studied it in depth and it, it's beyond the scope of, of today's talk because we could, we could spend two hours looking at amino acid profiles and things. Generally, the Lechanceas and the Saccharomyces have quite a strong overlap. So on those ones, it's really important to make sure the Saccharomyces is fed or start at a high level. So to, say 250 or, or more. Prelude and fruits in less so. And fruits in we actually see the opposite effect. It, it tends to lice quickly and, and actually put nutrition back into the must about halfway through fermentation. But um, it is a risk that non-sacs will scavenge your nitrogen. And that's why that's why I tend to make the recommendation, feed the saccharomyces only, don't feed the non-sac. Um, but because it is a risk, yeah. And it's particularly more, it's the biggest risk with the Lachancia. Genetically, Lachancia and Saccharomyces are not that far apart. Cool. Sean, hopefully that answered your question. If not, I can unmute you and we can go back and forth. As um, we're waiting to hear from I, Sean, we have one last question from I, Richard. I just, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, Chris. Um, actually, the does the time release nutrients of be, I could see that being fantastic with the non-sac as well, because you're not, if you're just adding, you know, a, a, an organic nitrogen early on, you're going to be, the first generations of yeast are probably going to take most of it. If you've got that time released, then that's, that's really smart. So I could see a really good synergy with that. And we have two time release. We have a boost and a complete, which the okay. complete is um, part boost as well. So Thank you for making that plug. Uh, no worries. No, no, it's it's a really nice synergy, I think. Mm -hmm. 
And then the question from Richard, if you can read that. That's a really interesting question. I My gut feel is to say no. I think non-SACs do all their work early on. And when you do silly, I think it's all sacred. It's, I, I can't give a definitive answer on this. I, I apologize. But my gut would say it's not. It's it's a sacrifice. He's giving you the nice sort of autolytic characters. You will have dead non a dead dead non saccharomyces there as well. Um, how quick do they lice is, is a good question. But I think actually it's saccharomyces. It's probably doing most of your your work on, on leaves. Sounds that, good. That's, but it's, it's, yeah, yeah. We have two more questions. Cool. If he keeps scrolling down, we have one from Jim. Okay, yes, Jim. I have to be honest and say, I do not know the answer to that. I, and I don't know those varieties. I, so I'm based in Denmark and in Denmark, the whole viticulture industry is based around hybrids. And in fact, my, my boss has planted six hectares. So what's that, that's about 12, that's 50, 15 acres. Of, I know she's got Solaris um, predominantly, but a few other things. I can ask that question and maybe we can get back to you. Um, and if you happen to be on, in Ontario in July and at the Cool Climate Symposium, we hope to have some information on hybrids and non saccharomyces. And but, Jim, I wrote your name down. I have a document that we worked with the reps in that area that um, kind of paired what what uh, yeast would go well with those cold climate grapes. I can work with them to send it to you, but I don't know if those two are on there, but we can look. All right, I think we have time for one more question, which is Brian's yeah. on the, the list. Yeah. Would high concentrations of SO2 be inhibitory to non-stack if added into a tank? From I think it's diluted, yeah. Yeah, potentially it could. Again, it depends on the levels, but we do see pretty, we do see a lot of sensitivity of non saccharomyces to SO2, particularly. So the two Lachances and Prelude, so that's the, the Octave, Concerto, and, and Prelude, the limit is 30 parts per million. Fruits in the limit's 45 parts per million. So there's a little bit more scope to with, with SO2, but I, I would be nervous because the, the, you don't want to have a pocket of SO2 that suddenly wipes out the yeast population in that portion of the tank. So yeah, I, again, it depends on the levels, but I'd probably be a little bit nervous. It's one of the, one of the things to watch with non-saccharomyces is, is the SO2. And we've, we've seen plenty of examples where um, we've maybe not seen the best results from a trial and we've gone back and we've realized that it's Riesling at pH three, but there was 15 free SO2 and that works out at about 0.8 molecular and that's more than enough to kill a non-sac. So um, it, does, it is something that does need managing. I guess the flip side is if you're using this SO2, but you're using a non-sac, you've got the protection of the non-saccharomyces. And with that, we have reached our time limit. Um, I know that there's there's questions. Feel free to reach out to and respond to the original e-blast. We will be sending this out, this whole presentation out in another e-blast so you can save it to your files. But I wanna thank you, Duncan, for your time and everybody on the call, thank you for your time. I know you have other things you could be doing today. But thank you and I'm um, happy to answer any other questions and appreciate your business and time. Thank you. Yep. And thank you everybody for joining and really hope it was constructive. And thanks so much, Chris, for organizing today. Yes, thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.